invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Our sermon text will be verses 5 through 17. I'm going to begin in verse 1. This is the word of our God, so let us give our attention to its reading. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, again we bow our heads and our hearts before you, giving thanks to you for your word, seeking for your blessing that we might not merely comprehend this with our minds, but in comprehending your word that it might that it might work within our hearts. That you would continue that work of sanctification within us. That you, O oh God, would be glorified in our lives. Help us, O oh God, as we turn to your word. That we might be shaped by it. We might see again our great need for Christ. And the wondrous deliverance that you have worked in him in our behalf. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless. And that you would continue your presence with us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we are continuing our study of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, much like uh, most sort of systematic theologies, it's moving in a fairly logical way, and it's using, of course, the Apostles' Creed as its outline. And so we have spent time in the previous weeks looking at the big picture of our deliverance. That is, it begins, remember, of course, with our sin, our guilt before God, and therefore the deliverance that is worked for us by Jesus Christ. And in looking to the person and work of Christ, we note his, his, his humiliation and his exaltation. And last week we looked at the second coming of Christ, that he would come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. This is part of his exaltation. That he is not just king, but he is the judge. In the Old Testament, these offices would be closely related. And so it's not surprising to see that in the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the person of Jesus Christ, that king and judge are likewise uh, related. We noted last week especially the comfort that we have in the reality of that judgment. That it is not something that strikes fear in the heart of God's people. 
but rather it's something to which we look forward to, something we long for, knowing that it is then that Jesus will set all things right. Ours is a transformationalism that looks to the coming of Christ, who will transform our mortal bodies to be like unto his glorious body. Well, this week we began a new section in the Catechism. It's still under the big heading of deliverance, and there are six articles that are included in this particular part of the Catechism and this part of the Apostles' Creed. The first of these articles treats the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Next, it begins to speak about the church, which the Holy Spirit gathers, confirms, and preserves. Well, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and everlasting life include the benefits of Christ, which the Holy Spirit confers upon His church. And so there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, logic as it moves through. For all of these benefits, uh, the Spirit is the one who bestows. The Spirit is the one who gives these things. And indeed, the Spirit is the one who is with us, as we see in our text this evening. With us, confirming, assuring, building us up in the most holy faith. In systematic theology, there's an acknowledgement of the connection between the doctrine of the Spirit and the doctrine of the church. Just as there is a connection between the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of salvation. And in fact, one of the, one of the key points, and this is a side point... But if you happen to study charismatic or Pentecostal theology, one of the key points is that they divorce the work of the Spirit from the work of the church. And their ecclesiology is often lacking. Well, we're talking this evening about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And our question this evening gives our attention to three things. First, the person of the Spirit, His office, and His gifts. What do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? The person of the Spirit. That the Spirit with the Father and the Son is eternal God. Second, that He is given also to me. We know, of course, the personal nature of this catechism. It's meant so that the one who is learning it would, would truly internalize these teachings. He is given also to me. We think of Pentecost as that event that happened so long ago. And indeed it did. It's a once for all pouring out of the Spirit. But that once for all, for all point pouring out ripples throughout history and continues down even to our own day. The Spirit is given to me. So that through true faith, He makes me share in Christ and all His benefits, comforts me, and will remain with me forever. So this evening we'll consider our great need for the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the benefits of the Holy Spirit. Turning to what is perhaps one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, Romans chapter 8. We begin with the need for God's Spirit, the need for the Holy Spirit. And Paul is picking up here after, after looking at Romans chapter 6 and 7 and speaking of, of, of the sinfulness that remains. He goes on to point out that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has succeeded where everything in the Old Testament failed. And we don't want to say that God failed in the Old Testament. Of course not. All of those things, the types and the shadows, they were pointing us toward Christ and driving all of history, and especially redemptive history, toward Jesus and His ministry. But Paul turns his attention then to the work of the Spirit. What is the great need of the Spirit that the Apostle picks up on here? Pick, look with me at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul sort of separates things here into those two categories, flesh and spirit. You'll notice that spirit in the ESV is capitalized, and I believe that's correct. It's not simply spirituality that Paul is talking about. There are some who might want to say that to think spiritually is what is key. To look at the world through a spiritual lens, if you will. But that would be to divorce what Paul is saying from the person and work of Christ who poured out the Spirit. No, this Spirit is none other than the Holy Spirit. 
And so he's speaking here of the distinction between those who set their minds on the flesh and those who set their minds on the Spirit or on the things of the Spirit. The mind that Paul is speaking of here has to do with a kind of broad way of understanding. It's, it's, it's sort of what has your focus? What has your attention? For those who know our Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of man? It's that kind of chief end language. What is the key? What is at the heart of, your, of what you long for? Here Paul says to live according to the flesh. To set your minds on the things of the flesh. He will go on to say that it leads to death. So to set one's mind on the things of the spirit is to speak about this great reality. That to a, be, to, to a believer there is a change in the ultimate object of your attention. Of your desire. Indeed of your pursuit in life. Now very frankly very outset. We acknowledge that this is not something that we can do. It is not something that we can muster up. As though if we just try hard enough, we can steer our rudder in the right direction. No. It must be a work of God's Spirit, as we'll see itself. But moreover, this is not something that is optional. This is not something that believers can either do or not do. No, believers are those who are in the Spirit, who walk according to the Spirit. The Spirit, as I said, is none other than the third person of the Godhead, distinct from the Father and the Son, yet in relationship with them. It is called at times the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. He is the one who, who lighted upon uh, Jesus like a dove when he was baptized. He, along with the Father and the Son, is the name into which we are baptized. He is a person. He is not some emanating force as some claim. He is the one whom the Father and the Son send after Jesus departs from his disciples in Acts chapter 2. He is co-eternal with the Father. Ursinus, in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, he says of the Spirit, there is communicated to him the essence of the Father and the Son because he proceeded from both and is the spirit of both. But the essence of God includes everything that is in him. And inasmuch as this is indivisible, it must necessarily be communicated to him entire. In other words, it's not as though the Holy Spirit is merely a part of God. The part that's invisible and, and with us. Sometimes God, the Godhead is spoken of that way. The Father is that part in heaven. The Son is that part who walked on earth. The Spirit is the part that is sent. No, each is a person. Each is fully and completely God. And what good news that is. For what we need is not simply a part, but we need the whole of our God to, to protect, to guide, to redeem us from this wicked world. Indeed, to redeem us from ourselves. For there is nothing... Nothing short of life versus death at stake here. Eternal life. Eternal death. And that's what Paul turns to in verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Here he speaks of the, fo of the result of the focus. Death versus life. Death results because the mind that is set on the flesh is apart from Christ. Life and peace are the result of the mind set on the spirit. Not because of some reward for good deeds, as we saw this morning. It could not be that, as we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 9. But because of the believer's relationship to Christ. Paul brings it all down to this. Because in the flesh, man is hostile to God. Verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is one of those passages where we understand our doctrine of sin. It's not simply a hindrance in our lives as though we just need to outgrow it. Or maybe to try and stop it. 
Stop doing bad things like a bad habit. No, to set the mind in the flesh. To have that, that direction of one's life that is according to the world, that is according to the flesh, is hostile to God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, James tells us. Therefore, to have one's mind set on the things of the flesh is none other than to be at enmity with God. Notice there is no neutrality supposed in Paul's argument. There is no virtuous pagan. No. Those who have their minds set on the flesh, those who are in the flesh, cannot please God. For the law is a reflection of God's holiness. To refuse to submit to that law as the standard of holiness is to be in open rebellion against God. And there are ample examples of that for us throughout Scripture. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Israel in the Golden Calf, which we looked at again this morning. The Pharisees in Jesus' own day. It's the Pharisees that catch my attention the most. Of course, yes, at Sinai, the people of Israel had seen so much of God's works and all of His wondrous deeds, and yet they still turned away from His law and built the calf and bowed down to worship it. But in Jesus' day, there were those who saw Him heal, who saw Him cast out demons. All the things that we read the Bible and we say we would love to be able to witness that. They witnessed it. And yet they rejected. Why? Because their minds were set on the flesh. They were not set on the things of the Spirit. And indeed, beloved, this is why we must have the work of God's Spirit within us in order to redeem us from sin and death. All of those examples that we could look at, Israel, the Pharisees, Adam and Eve, they make evidence that it's not just about having enough education. The Pharisees had the most education. It's not a matter of being innocent. Adam and Eve were completely innocent. It's not about seeing the wondrous, mighty works of God. The Israelites had that in abundance. No. What we need is God's Spirit to work. And we see this beginning in verse 9, as Paul turns, having laid out what's at stake, death versus life, he says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. It's important to see the connections that Paul is making, as well as to understand the general thrust of his argument. He is saying what it is to not have the Spirit. It is to be at odds with the Lord. But this, does not, this is not meant to, to, to take it as though the Christians were to doubt their being in Christ. Remember how chapter 8 begins. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are with us. When we look at the end of chapter 8, there is no separation from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Now it's key to understand here that Paul is not laying it out as kind of a hypothetical conditional, as though the, uh, the Roman Christians were left in doubt. No, he's using what's, what's referred to in the Greek as a first-class conditional. And this means that Paul is assuming that this is true of his readers. They do have the Spirit. In other words, it can be translated this way. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of God dwells within His people. This is something that is worthy of our attention, worthy even of our meditation, to recognize that the Spirit lives in each individual believer whose body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, here we see that Paul is saying that the Spirit dwells in God's people. Well, what does he do? He goes on and he says that he makes you alive. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now that righteousness is none other than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Jesus Christ being imputed to the believer, received by faith alone. This is, in fact, the work of the Holy Spirit who unites us to Christ. And again, the conditional that Paul is using here is a first-class conditional. Since Christ is in you. 
And you might wonder, what does he mean? That the body is dead because of sin. The reality is, beloved, that our bodies have within themselves the principle of death due to sin. This was the threat and part of the judgment in the Garden of Eden. This is not something that we can avoid unless Christ returns. No amount of faith, healing, or speaking positive words will change this reality. Simply put, it is our reality. And every day that our earthly bodies break down, we are reminded both of the curse of sin, but also the blessing of salvation. For we are reminded that even though our, out, our outer body wastes away inwardly, we are being renewed, as Paul tells the Corinthians. There is then both death and life within us. We are a new creation in Christ, and yet we struggle with the old creation. And at times, because our bodies waste away, it can seem that the old creation is winning. But Paul's point is to remind us that the Spirit of God dwells in God's people. The one who regenerates, the one who fills, is the one who gives new life. Note with this, note the significance of this. It, it's often said, that our justification by faith alone is a complete work of God. It is a monergistic work of God. He is the only one working. Monos and then the word for work. He is the only one working in our salvation. And that's true. We do not contribute. As we talked about this morning. We do not contribute anything to our salvation except the sin which made it necessary. But it can be said, and some people will say, it's our sanctification where it's God plus us. It's God's efforts and our efforts, and together those produce sanctification. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Oh, indeed, there is the call to mortify our sin, to put to death the deeds of the body. But it's only by the Spirit. It's not some work that we do. It's not some work that we can, can we combine our efforts with God's in order to produce something that's greater. No, it is the Spirit who lives within us. The Spirit who dwells within us, who empowers, who enables, who makes us alive. Look at verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So again, the conditional is important. It's a first-class conditional again. Paul is not setting up a series of, of opportunities for the believers in Rome to question whether or not they really, really do truly, absolutely have the Spirit. No. He is saying, since the Spirit dwells in you, this is true. The simple fact that though our mortal bodies will one day rest in the grave, it is not the end of the story. No. Paul focuses our attention upon Christ and His resurrection. And it is in that resurrection that Jesus raised up for our justification. We, united to Him, raised up and seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that our mortal bodies are given life. That is, we are enabled more and more to die into sin and to live unto righteousness. The resurrection is at the center of the Apostle Paul's understanding of, 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 of the believer's life. It is the resurrection that justifies us. It is the resurrection that sanctifies us. It is indeed true that the resurrection is our abiding hope. For our mortal bodies will waste away and we will die. Our souls will return to God. But on, a, on that last day, when that final trumpet sounds, our mortal bodies will once more be filled with life and raised to be indestructible. In the presence of God's Spirit, the dwelling of the, of the Spirit in the believer is further proof of this. We don't see this necessarily in this text, but Paul speaks of it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, In Him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, the praise of his glory. 
taking Romans 8 and Ephesians 1 together there, what we see is, is, is an absolute and abundant doctrine of God's Spirit with His people, enabling, building up, carrying us along, promising us that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Beloved, think for a moment about the comfort in that, the comfort of God's Spirit. For who among us has not, have not had those moments where after having professed faith in Jesus Christ, have continued to wrestle with one sin or another and wondered whether or not we are truly saved, whether or not God's Spirit still dwells within us. The Apostle Paul uses these words in Ephesians that we are sealed, that there is a guarantee, a guarantee, it's a deposit that, that promises the whole of everything that God has said. And indeed, we see this worked out for us in the rest of our text this evening. The benefits of God's Spirit. So we see the need for God's Spirit, the work of God's Spirit, and then on the back page, the benefits of God's Spirit. It begins with being empowered to put sin to death. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now you might wonder what it means to be a debtor. I mean, to be a debtor, of course, means to be obligated towards something or someone. If you are indebted to someone, then you must pay them back what is owed. Paul is saying that because of our break with sin, we are not obligated to the flesh. This is, we are not obligated to the human nature is corrupted, directed, and controlled by sin. There is an absolute, total, and complete break. He speaks of this in chapter 6, where he says that, that we were once slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are servants of God to righteousness. We have no debt to the flesh. That slavery has been ended. It is broken in Christ. But what does this mean that we have a debt to the Spirit? And I, I mean, I should, I should ask it this way. Does this mean that we have a debt to the Spirit? He says that, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Does it mean we have a debt to the Spirit? I don't, I don't think so. We are not in debt to live according to the Spirit as if we come and try and settle our accounts with God. I mean, think about how that just couldn't work anyway. Think about your redemption. Think about how you have been delivered from sin. You have been given new life in Christ. You are, you are indwelt with the Spirit. What could you give to God that would, that, would, that would settle that debt? Nothing. I don't believe that we are in debt. No, Paul says that we are children of God. We are heirs. How can we owe anything? We have everything in Christ. It is true that we seek to live lives of holiness out of redemptive gratitude and love for God, but not out of a debt. But how do we do that? How do we live those lives of holiness in redemptive gratitude? We put to death the deeds of the body. Remember what it means to live according to the flesh. To order our lives towards that sinful, corrupt nature. This is something the believer must not do. If we live according to the flesh, then really is evidence that one is not trusting in Christ. To live this way brings death because it is to be an unbeliever or to be an apostate. A Christian is one who has had this whole direction and outlook changed. We are not indebted to the flesh to live according to its desires. Rather, the whole point of this verse is, is to stress that we are children of God. And the call then is to live as children of God. Now, of course, I know the immediate response. How often are we going to mess that up? The answer is often. The answer is that we're going to continue to wrestle with this reality. And God is going to continue to work it out in us. But that is His promise. That is the confidence that we have in God. That He has promised, He has begun this work, and He will carry it on to completion. As 
Paul will say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, according to his good pleasure. So we are empowered to put sin to death. Next, we see the reality of this, of this transition, this change, no longer belonging to, th to this world, no longer belonging to the flesh, but rather being adopted as children of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is some of the scriptures that are behind the great doctrine of our adoption. We are saved by God. We are justified. That is true. But we are also brought into the household and family of God. This is important. I know in our day, the, the, the language of households just doesn't seem to, seem to be much, uh, uh, to hold much weight nowadays. And you talk with somebody about infant baptism, and you look at Acts, and you say, there are household baptisms. And their response is, well, but how do you know there are any infants in those households? It's a household. It's all of them. But here, Paul's drawing attention to the reality that we are taken out of the family of the world, out of the family of Satan. We are joined into the family and household of God. That just as our justification declares us righteous, so our adoption declares that God is our Heavenly Father. There are so many benefits to this great truth, so many benefits to this great doctrine. We don't have time to delve into them all, and maybe they're not all given to us here in this text, but I just want to say a few. The first is that we have access to God. We have access to God, not as a great judge over all of creation, not as the great judge who declares us as righteous through faith, but as our Heavenly Father, as the one who cares for us. Because that's the second thing. We have access to God. But we're also cared for by God. We cast our cares on God because He cares for us. As a perfect father cares for his children. He protects us. Nothing comes into our lives that is outside of God's fatherly care. Which means that He will care for us through it all. This has, this, this, this idea, this doctrine of adoption, that we are made sons of God, has wonderful application in the lives of God's people. But it's not the kind of application where you go and do something. It's the kind that you remind yourself of over and over and over again. You continue to put your trust in the Lord, knowing who He is, knowing how He cares. He pities us. He protects us. He provides. And there's more, of course. We are chastened by God. That is that idea of being disciplined, positively being trained, being corrected. God loves us too much to not work in our lives, to not expose our sin, to not convict us by His Spirit of those things that we harbor within our hearts that we ought not to harbor. And yet, the promise is we are never cast off. The Apostle Paul draws our attention to the work of the Spirit in our adoption. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption. He is the spirit of holiness, yes. He is the spirit even of righteousness. He is the spirit of glory. But here Paul focuses on the spirit of adoption. That is, the spirit whom we have received does not cause us to fall back into fear of God's wrath. Not slavery of the flesh, but of adoption as the children of God. Indeed, we are able to call upon him as Abba, Father. That brings us then to the end of our text. The benefits of God's Spirit with us, empowered to put sin to death, adopted as children of God, but also the assurance of the Spirit. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. John Calvin comments, he says, Paul means that the Spirit of God gives us such a testimony that when he is our guide and teacher, our spirit is made assured of the, of the adoption of God. For our mind of its own self, without the preceding testimony of the Spirit, could not convey to us this assurance. God's Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we belong to Him. And we shouldn't think that this kind of bearing witness with our spirit is sort of a direct kind of revelation. As though we hear whispered in our ears, you are a child of God. No, it is a witness to our spirit. But the key point here is that the spirit makes manifest to us. He makes manifest in sealing to the hearts of believers the promises which are theirs as heirs of God and as joint heirs with Christ. It is this, it is from this that assurance comes. That is when we focus upon these realities, when we set our minds on these things of the Spirit, we find ourselves walking in assurance. It is true that we doubt. It is true that we struggle. It is true that we take our eyes off of these great truths and we look at the circumstances around us. Rather than seeing God as leading us and saying, He will safe, bring us safely through. We can too easily say, if God loved us, why are these things happening? We doubt because we look at our works and at our own efforts. But when we look to Christ and trust in the work of the Spirit within us, we have assurance. And it is God's Spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And note how Paul lays this out for us. If children, then heirs. Now this is not an additional step in our salvation. As though first we are delinquents, and then we are stepchildren, and then true children, and then we become heirs. To come to Christ, professing faith, is evidence of the Spirit's work, and evidence itself of the Spirit's indwelling. It is that indwelling that makes you a child of God. It is that indwelling that makes you an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. That is, your inheritance is already guaranteed. Now this is lifting up the doctrine of adoption to the greatest heights that we can imagine. For we think of Christ and we know that He's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. We know that He is the one who is all glorious. And we know that, that were we to look upon Him, that we, we, we could likely be consumed. For we are sinners. But this is the glory and the grace of God. That he does, in fact, lift us up and seat us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And like Christ, who inherits a heavenly, incorruptible, and eternal inheritance. So we also inherit that which is incorruptible and eternal. Paul says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We are co-heirs with Christ, which means that we follow the pattern of Christ. We are conformed to the pattern, first to suffer and then to enter into glory. But think about what Paul is saying here in the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. The reality of suffering certainly can be frightening, but the presence of God's Spirit Ensuring that it is not just some haphazard circumstances that are happening, but rather being led by our loving Heavenly Father, taking up our cross and following after Christ, being indwelt by God's Spirit, ensuring that we will in fact reach that finish line. It encourages, it empowers, it enables us to continue to walk the way that God calls us to walk. And this is Paul's point. Upon reflection on these great truths, it shapes how we face the rest of our lives. It shapes how we face the rest of our week. It shapes how we face tomorrow. For tomorrow is ordered by God. Tomorrow is given that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. Tomorrow is given that we might trust God as our Heavenly Father. And the truth is, beloved, 
we will grow in this. And there are times that we will struggle with this. But may God, by His grace, continue to work within us. That our trust of Him, toward Him, would be not only, not only um, confirmed, but encouraged and renewed day after day after day as we walk according to the Spirit, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit and not on the things of the flesh.